He's a, he has a PhD from EUCS and at MIT. He's currently a postdoc at uh, Amazon. Right? Yes. And he'll be starting as a professor at Columbia uh, in the IOR department soon. Uh, he's an expert in causal inference um, and cutoff factor decision making uh, with observational data. And today he's going to be talking about um, some tricky issues with matrix completion and the entries are um, have confounders. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be back here. Uh, so today I'll be talking about causal matrix completion. At the end of the talk, uh, time permitting, I'll talk about some of its applications to causal offline RL. Um, this, the first part of the work is joint work with uh, Munzer, Devrat, and Dennis. Munzer and Devrat are my advisors at MIT along with uh, Abadur Abadi. And uh, Dennis is a longtime friend and collaborator, and he's here at UC Berkeley as a POTC postdoc. So I think matrix completion is probably very familiar to a lot of you. Um, the canonical application is uh, when we think of recommendation systems. So rows are different users, columns are different movies, there are lots more movies than any human could uh, uh, rate. And so you see a very sparse setting, a set of entries being observed. Um, and the goal is to somehow recover the missing entries at the highest level. That's what matrix completion is about. And um, when we think about these kinds of applications of matrix completion to recommendation systems, uh, the data is kind of interesting looking, like what do you observe and don't observe? So if you look at, these are two canonical data sets that people think about in matrix completion. One is the coat data set and another is movie lens. You can see that there's a sort of clustering that happens within the data itself. Certain users tend to rate the same kind of movies and then they don't rate, tend to rate anything else, right? So people say who like, uh, horror films might only watch horror films and nothing else. And people who like action films only watch action films, things like that. So you have this kind of block sparsity show up in your, in your data, right? So this kind of block sparse structure tends to be quite ubiquitous in, in recommendation systems. Another thing that people maybe don't, uh, are not so familiar with in, in CS and OR is, um, but is quite familiar in economics and policy evaluation is uh, things like staggered adoption, right? Where say rows are different individuals, columns are time, and people are adopting a policy um, in, in a staggered way. Say with Medicare, um, people ad adopt Medicare at say age 65 or whatever it is. And before that, you're observing the outcomes without Medicare. And then you would like to know what would the outcomes be without Medicare after 65 and that's missing, right? So um, that kind of leads to this kind of staircase structure in your data. It also shows up in uh, another kind of, a, of design, experiment design that's quite popular in economics of pilot studies where you, give an, an intervention to a small number of people, you see how well it does. And based on that, you decide whether to give it more broadly or to some other sequence of people. So that kind of leads to like a staggered adoption style, uh, a staircase style pattern with the data. Probably one that's very familiar to a lot of you here, probably more than uh, for me itself is say contextual bandits. Yeah, say you can think of in the finite state and action case, at least, I can think of rows as states, columns as actions. And then each entry would say be the observed reward for uh, a, a particular state and action tuple. Right? And then if you're not observed, if you haven't particularly visited that state action uh, tuple, then that, that reward is missing. And if you're running any sort of a meaningful, a sensible uh, contextual bandit policy, what you'll find is that places that have higher reward will tend to be visited more. Right? And, as, and if there is any sort of continuity between state and actions and, and the reward function as a result of it, you kind of see this kind of piecewise block structure if you start plotting this data uh, with any sort of CD algorithm. Okay. So the first thing I hope to leave you with is that matrix completion is, is a lot more rich than just recommendation systems, right? It can encode a, a wide variety of problems. Even the talk we just heard, you can think of it as a matrix in some sense, right? And so recommendation system, staggered adoption, contextual bandits, and there's a lot more out there. And the goal across these different applications is to impute the missing entries that you haven't observed and the entries that you have observed, you want to denoise them because they might be observed noisily or there's inherent randomness in how things are observed. So you want to both denoise observed entries and impute missing entries. The challenge towards a unified approach is that different applications induce very different sparsity patterns. That's really the challenge of, of um, trying to think of, think of all these various problems through the unified lens of matrix completion. So here's a formal setup for matrix completion. We'll save an M by N matrix. I'm going to define my expected outcomes as M, and I'm going to define my noisy outcomes or my random outcomes as YIJ equals to MIJ plus epsilon IJ. Epsilon, we're going to take it as mean zero sub Gaussian noise. And there's some binary matrix A, which lives in zero, one times, times n to the n. 
And if AIJ is equal to one, then I observe it. I observe YIJ. If AIJ is equal to zero, then it's missing. And in essence, the goal of matrix completion is given this Y tilde and given A, I want to produce an M hat such that M hat is close to M and some norm. Okay. Some uh, standard norms that people think about say would be the Frobenius norm, which is the recovery on average over all the variety of entries. A stronger norm would say be the infinity norm where I want to produce a uh, entry-wise guarantees for every entry of the matrix. Any questions so far about the setup of matrix completion? And so obviously matrix completion has been studied for a long time. The focus of this talk is thinking about why data is missing. So your Y is your matrix of your noisy potential outcomes. Your A is your observed matrix that determines your missingness. And the question that comes down to is under what conditions is your Y matrix independent of your A matrix? Okay. That's the question we're gonna explore. Um, there are a variety of models of missingness that have been studied. I'm kind of borrowing this from Don Rubin, who is at Harvard. He kind of came up with this way of thinking about it. The first one is called missing completely at random. And I'll define these in a second uh, for short MCAR. Um, the second one is a word I've come up with. I'm going to call it literature missing not at random or LMNOR. And these are, so far, at least in the literature, the majority of models have been, that have been considered fall into these two categories. There's also something called missing at random, which I call in between these two. I'll talk about it in a second. And the most general model would be MNAR, which is missing not at random. We'll talk about this in a second. And the problem is that um, MCAR and LMNAR, the, the work that's been done so far, does not provide a unified approach to the variety of sparsity patterns we're going to look at. Okay, so here I'm going to borrow a quote by um, Ma and Chen, who are um, at Carnegie Mellon, George Chen in particular. Um, and so they wrote a recent paper in Europe 2019. And the last, the conclusion of the paper said the following. They said, in terms of the theoretical analysis, we've not addressed the full generality of MNAR data in matrix completion. They say our theory breaks down when the probability of observation is exactly zero. So for example, in the recommendation system, say a vegetarian may never go to a steakhouse, that could not be dealt with with the models that have been uh, proposed so far for missing this models. They also assume that, we assume that each entry is revealed independent of every other entry. Okay, so for example, in the staggered adoption setting, if I tell you your data is missing at time t, then you also know that the data is missing at time t plus one, right? So then that condition is no longer, cannot longer hold. And they say these are two open problems amongst many for robustly handling MNAR data with guarantees, right? Another one more from the causal lens perspective is that say in contextual bandits, the state actions that are visited are going to be correlated or i.e. confounded with the expected reward, right? And so you have this kind of correlation structure that needs to be thought about very carefully. And I note that similar assumptions are also made by a recent paper by uh, Soham Bhattacharya and Sort of Chatterjee who are at Stanford and by Yang Ding Wu Nadell uh, who are at Cornell. Uh, and further, I note that most of the results that exist for um, matrix completion tend to be a recovery on, on average over all the entries of the matrix. So recover in Frobenius norm, right? But in a lot of these settings, say in the staggered adoption setting, that's not very meaningful. I'd like to know the result for just the part of the data that's missing. Ideally, what I'd like to know is I'd like to know entry-wise, I'd like to recover this matrix. So that would be the strongest no notion of recovery. But that's very few results exist for entry-wise recovery. Okay, so I'm, does the missingness model matter? Okay, so I'm trying to make a big hoo-ha about it. Does it actually matter? Can I just use the algorithms that exist so far? Maybe they just work as is, right? So it might be a theoretical curiosity, but empirically it doesn't really make a difference. So let me try to convince you that that's not the case. Okay, so here's a very simple example. I'm gonna deal with no noise. We're just gonna focus on the missingness. So here's a matrix that's 80 by 80. I'm gonna say it's rank five. Um, and they have this binary matrix A. I'm gonna first create a missing completely a random uh, data set out of this, where I'll, I'll sample each entry with probability 30%. Okay, so AIJ is equal to one with probability P, independent of everything else in your system. Okay, that's what I call MCAR data. And this is kind of the standard model of missingness that's been studied in the literature, starting with Candace and Tao in 09, Candace and Rect, Montanari, Hasty, a lot, of, a lot of very influential people have thought about this problem. Uh, the second model is LMNOR. What, when people say LMNOR, what they really mean is that the propensity with which an entry is observed can vary across the different entries. 
So Aij is equal to one with probability Pij rather than P, which is constant throughout the matrix. And this is the model uh, of missingness that was studied by Mayan Chen, by Vachari Chatterjee, yeah. And then the third model of missingness is where you can see I'm kind of breaking the key assumptions of the first two models. So I'm gonna say the minimum probability of observing something is going to be uh, zero. The, if I tell you whether one entry is missing, it, it informs you about whether another entry is missing. And the underlying uh, matrix M can be arbitrarily correlated with A. So you can, can see at least visually how the different missingness patterns look like. And now we're gonna run a very simple uh, empirical task. So here in light blue is the true distribution of that 80 by 80 matrix. So it's a 1600 total ratings. I'm just plotting the distribution between one to five. In dark blue is the observed MCAR sample. So this is like approximately 30% of the samples that have been observed. I'm gonna distribute, I'm gonna sample, I'm gonna plot the distribution as well. And the, the task at hand is that given these observed samples, can I recover the true distribution? Okay, probably the first thing one should do when they run matrix completion is see whether they can do that. And you can see here, because the data is MCAR, the, the um, up to a normalization, the dark blue looks like the light blue. Right? They kind of just look like uh, scalings of each other, as you would expect because it's MCAR data. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is run a method called Universal Single Value Thresholding, USVT, which is a very popular method in the matrix completion literature. It's by a paper by Saurav Chatterjee at, uh, at the Analysis Statistic. And actually, to a surprise, it didn't actually work. So um, when you try, to you try to use USVT to recover the true distribution, it just tends to predict the mean. You can see the difference in scaling 140 to 200. We've tried another method, which is soft compute by uh, Hasty et al., which is a very popular optimization-based method. And that works beautifully, right? You can look at the, the dark blue that's recovered completely covers the light blue, as you'd expect. Visually, it's, it's, it's working really nicely. The third method is a method that we're gonna propose called synthetic nearest neighbor, and I'll, I'll, I'll describe it in a second. Uh, SNN for short, and that also works quite well, right? The dark blue is kind of covering the light blue. At least with MCAR data, there's an algorithm that works reasonably well. Some methods tend to actually not work, even though they were designed for the MCAR case. The next setting is LMNAR data, where now you can see there's a bias in the, in the observed distribution, right? It does not look like MCAR data anymore. There's a bias in the sampling procedure. And I'm gonna to try to recover the true distribution again. USVT actually works uh, worse now. The, it just seems to be predicting the mean. Right? And you can see that it predicts three with approximately a frequency of 600. Soft compute is working reasonably well, but not nearly as well as it was with MCAR data. There's clearly a bias. You see that the dark blue that's recovered, um, it's not fully covering up the light blue as you'd hope, right? The last method is SNN that uh, we proposed and it again works well. Okay, now let's move to the last case. So I'm breaking the assumptions of the methods so far. Um, and this is the observed MNAR data, and this is the true distribution again. USVT uh, doesn't work, unfortunately. But what was to our surprise is that by changing the sampling procedure for the missingness from LMNAR data to MNAR data, soft compute completely stops working, right? It was reasonably predicting the distribution well. Now, for some reason, it just seems to predict one, right? So you can see how sensitive these methods are to which uh, the model of missingness. So I hope I'm convincing that it is an important thing to think about. And I wouldn't show it to you if it didn't work, but SNN uh, is, is recovering the distribution really well again. Okay. And the only reason is because we thought very carefully about the missingness model, which so far matrix completion hasn't thought about. And so I, I hope to convince you that this is an important problem because recommendation systems are everywhere from movies and products to news articles. And with the increasing polarization of, of the web, we should think very carefully about what is being shown to whom at what time. Okay, something that's very important to think about. And even things like the US census, which is something that I've been thinking about a lot the last past year, approximately 40% of the data is missing for very sensitive columns like income and sexuality, things of that form. So, and that's clearly not gonna be missing at random. Right? So we need to think very carefully about why data is missing when we, um, when we try to use matrix completion or statistical methods in these kinds of settings. Any questions? Yes. So on those past slides, you were comparing the histograms of the predictions versus the truth, but that doesn't really say anything about the error of the predictions, right? I was just trying to visualize it. It, it corresponds very much to, to what you see there. Like if I plot the Frobenius norm recovery or the two norm recovery and pre-norm, you'll see the exact same thing. Okay. 
that this is just easier to visualize. So here's the SNM method. So it builds on two ideas. One is an idea from uh, machine learning of, of nearest neighbors. And the other one is from econometrics called synthetic controls. So how does nearest neighbor work? So say I want to fill up this entry here, which is a question mark. What I do is, okay, so what entries have been filled up here? The first column and the um, fifth column. So I'm gonna look at other rows that have their first column and fifth column filled up. It turns out the first row, the second row is. Then we look at what they filled up for the, uh, the fourth column. And we just use that to impute. Okay. And that's one nearest neighbor. You could come up with a K nearest neighbor version of this as well, where you take the average of K different things. Synthetic controls is a really core idea in econometrics where, um, where the sparsity pattern looks something like this, where you have this little top slice that's missing, the top right slice. Uh, the canonical example was uh, thinking about whether Prop 99, which is a, a tax on, on tobacco, um, if, that had been if that had not been passed, what would cigarette sales in California have been? And so what they do is they, um, it's a very, very clever idea um, by Abadi et al. Now it's kind of taken a life on its own really. And it says, okay, well, the other, we know the other 49 states didn't receive uh, such a, an intervention. So let's look at the data before California went into the intervention. I'm gonna to try to represent California as some combination of the other states. The different ways you can do this regression, Originally, it was convex regression. Now, there's a variety of other statistical methods that have been thought about, from like kernel methods, lasso. We'll talk about the one that we use, et cetera. And so you try to write y1 as some linear combination of x1. And then you take that beta hat that you learn, you apply it to x2, which is the, out the post intervention outcomes of the remaining states, and gives you a synthetic trajectory of California under control. Okay, it's a beautiful two step procedure. And synthetic nearest neighbors is really combining these two ideas. And I kind of think of it as almost like academic Sudoku. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. So say there's an entry IJ that I'd like filled up. What you do is I'm gonna find this matrix X that's fully filled up with certain properties. In particular, the corresponding elements of it in row I are filled up. The corresponding elements of it in column J are filled up. I'm gonna call that my anchor columns and my anchor rows. Now, if you just look at IJ, AC, X, and AR, it starts looking a lot like the synthetic controls problem, right? And now the only key trick is that we're gonna divide up X into K different chunks, okay? So I'm gonna divide into X1 to XK, and then I'm gonna learn a model between Y1 and X1. In particular, I'm gonna learn a linear model using principal component regression. So I first do PCA on X1, and then I do ordinary least squares. And I'm gonna repeat that process. I'm gonna take, learn that beta hat, apply it to X tilde one, to get my first estimate of m hat ij. I'm gonna do that k times for the k different blocks I created and take the average. So you can think of each of these steps as kind of creating a synthetic nearest neighbor. So there may not be another row that looks like you, but I'm saying some linear combination of the other rows looks like you. Okay, so I do this k different times, take the average, and that's the synthetic nearest neighbor algorithm. That's exactly what we use to produce the simulations uh, in a few slides ago. Any questions about the algorithm? Yeah, why did you break it into many? Why not just the one big block? Yeah, the reason is that when you're trying to create entry-wise guarantees, the K, by averaging over K different things, that gives you a level of denoising, implicit denoising that you, would, that you wouldn't get. At least we can't theoretically prove if you just run one massive regression. There's some sort of a bias variance trade-off. Yeah, exactly. That, that's, that's, one of, that's exactly what's happening, and that, and that K is, is tuning the bias variance trade-off. So do you have any empirical evidence that this is better? I mean, it's, I agree with your theory, but empirically that this is better than like this. So it's been mixed. So in certain times we find it, uh, so we offer it this way. So that we found that if you look at the rank of the matrix, if you take the, if each of these things has a rank that's the, the, the number of singular values uh, is a lot smaller than the ambient dimension, and you do this k different times, the estimate you get from each of those k things looks a lot like the estimate you get if you run the whole thing. And then by averaging, that's what helps you produce these confidence intervals, which at least, so you're kind of doing it k different times to get an uncertainty estimate. And so consistency wise, you produce the same thing, but I wouldn't know how to produce a confidence interval if you just did it with one. Yes. So something that I like is that you mentioned is that the way that the matrix the treatment you observe is different. Can, can we get it right into like how is method is solving the problem of like uh, interest 
Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question about how can you transport this? How can you deal with? So when I get to the assumptions, I'll come back to your question. Oh. Yeah. Yes, I was thinking another natural thing to do would be run something like the median of means. Mm -hmm. Because you really want consistency, not just like one sided. So that might be a great idea. I think the median of means maybe might also be a robust to so like you know, what we are requiring is that the assumption falls for each of those k parts separately. And so median of means might help you deal with if it only holds for some, you know, the majority of them, but not all of them. So that's a fantastic idea. Um, I haven't I haven't tried that yet. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I I would ask about the fully observed sub matrix. Yeah. So it, for each row i and column j, we uh, are we always very sure about finding out that big enough x? I mean, yeah, excellent. So uh, I'll give three different answers to that. The first is if you have missing completely a random data, just in the baseline, then with high probability, these kinds of blocks will exist. That's my first answer. My second answer is that a lot of the empirical applications we talked about, like the in, in econometrics with the staircase style pattern, this, this is there almost by definition of the, of, the, of the problem. And then the third thing is that when we think about experiment design, I'm going to talk about um, how do you actually, so then where you can actually choose which elements of the matrix to look at, then you can actually make sure that you have, you have it. So those are my three answers. So say for the stale case, for example, then do you request all the sub x k to be of the same anchor states and uh, for anchor column and anchor? You don't actually. I you don't. Just for simplification. Yeah. Uh, is our basic clarification, are rows and columns symmetrical here? You could run it in the transpose and it. But in some applications, is it more natural to do one or yes, the other? Yes, exactly. exactly. Um, how about I take some in a bit uh, at the end of the talk? That's right. Good question. Okay, so now let's get to the, the assumptions of when does synthetic air stable work. So in general, if you have no data, you cannot recover this any sort of matrix because the number of unknowns is going to be much larger than the number of observations. So you need some sort of structure in your data. The fundamental assumption that's always made in these settings is your data is low rank or approximately low rank, um, which basically says that there exists a latent factor model representation where the columns can be represented by m times r parameters, and the number of columns can be represented by n times r parameters. It just is where r is basically a lot smaller than m and n. Now, what kind of missingness is allowed? So this is kind of the key thing. What kind of missingness do we allow? We allow for something called selection on latent factors. Okay, so what that means is if you look at assumption one, what that implies is that yij is equal to ui comma vj, the inner product plus epsilon ij. Okay, that's what a low, low rank model buys you. What we require is that condition on these latent factors, your treatment assignment is independent of epsilon, okay, the remaining noise in your system. And so these two assumptions together, what they imply is that the potential outcomes become independent of your intervention assignments, conditional on u and v. Now, what does this not allow for? What this doesn't allow for is adaptive uh, intervention assignments. So say I looked at the matrix, I looked at what rating you got. Based on what rating you got, I choose the next rating you get. Then your intervention assignment is a function of the previous epsilons, and there's no longer, this breaks down. There are ways to deal with that in specific cases, uh, but I won't get into that in this talk at least. So, but at the same time, this is, um, it still allows for things like the probability of observing an entry can be exactly zero, that they can be correlated, the various entries of A, and M um, can be um, not independent of A. Now, these are the other operating assumptions. And now I'm going to go back to your question. The type of assumptions we require are what we call span inclusions. The two assumptions require is that for every K, the expectation of XK, let's say X1, the, the row span of it, that includes the expectation of Y. Okay, so that basically means that you can represent y as some linear combination of x1. Right? So that's what motivates linear regression. Now, when you transfer your model across these different interventions, as, as you were asking, what you require is that this particular expectation of this thing, x tilde 1, that lies in the column span of expectation of x1. Okay? And this, this kind of um, span inclusion on the column side is what we call 
is, is kind of a linear algebraic take on, on causal transportability, which is an important topic that people have been studying nowadays, machine learning. Yes. For every and each row. You need it for every, this is like an instance space requirement for every IJ. Okay. And then for every IJ, if I take my X and break it up, I require it for every K. Of course, there's also some freedom on which X I take. Yes. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, what happens if it's like approximately the stand, but not exactly? It's so well, the results will kind of pipe through in the same way, but with an approximation error. It's kind of lit. It just scales with a plus that approximation error. And you can kind of show that if the, the rows of this are sample ID, then these kinds of conditions hold high probability. Okay. <clears throat> the last thing you need is because we assume that every entry is observed noisily if it's observed. What you require is that the smallest single value of the expected matrix that is much larger than the largest single value of the noise matrix given by epsilon. Okay, and so there's the separation of signal and noise. In particular, when you plot, when you look at your data of x1 and xk, you should see this kind of elbow show up. If this elbow shows up, that means you're in a that you should use this kind of method. If it doesn't show up, then don't use this kind of method. So it's kind of a you can think of it as a well conditioning, uh, well conditioned kind of uh, condition. Yeah, and, and many people have thought about these kinds of problems of, of separation of signal and noise, uh, at least in econometrics, uh, my earliest references by Chamberlain in 83, um, and then Huan Bai and, and uh, Srina Ung in, um, in 19 by Hoyt Cornell, and many other people as well. And the last thing required is I'm going to parameterize the results by how big X is. Okay. So I'm going to say, let's assume X is the size K cubed by K squared. I'm going to create x1 to xk, each of size k squared by k squared. So I'm going to create k of these blocks, each of size k squared by k squared. I'm going to parameterize my results in, in terms of k. Any questions about the assumptions? Okay. So given that, these are the theoretical results I can show for um, synthetic nearest neighbor. First is finite sample consistency. That is for every pair ij that satisfies our assumptions, the four I listed above. You can show that m hat ij minus m ij, it scales as this rate, where r is the rank of the matrix m, and k is the number of synthetic nearest neighbors you have. So basically scales as r three over two, divided by square root k. I know it again, as uh, someone has asked me earlier, you can prove that uh, k is going to be growing quick enough uh, with m car data. And the second thing we can show to produce confidence intervals is that for every IJ pair that satisfies our assumptions, if you appropriately normalize it by square root K and you divide it by the effective standard deviation, I'll talk about how to estimate this in a second, it goes to a standard normal. And that's what lets you produce uh, quantify your uncertainty. Any questions about the, yes? So K is something that we decide, right? We separate K separately. So k is something, so uh, k cubed by k square is something that we don't decide. I'm just assuming that this exists. If you have a k cubed by k square, how to break it up? I, we decided to break it up into k, k square by k square sub matrices. Uh, ask in another way, is the argument taking us into k? Is the argument? Algorithm. The algorithm is not taking into, into k, the result is. Okay. So the argument is searching for the largest x. Yes, exactly. Uh, but then it uses x and breaks it up into k. K blocks of size. So k, k is an input or not? K is not an input. So, <laughs> so, so if you give me a, a matrix of this size, okay, I'm going to divide it up. So it tries to find a matrix of that shape yes. of maximum size. Yes. I see. Yes. Okay. The parameter that, that the algorithm is doing is if it finds a matrix of this size, it'll break it up into K blocks right. of K squared. Yeah. How fast is the algorithm? How fast is the algorithm? Uh, so if this part has been, if this matrix has been found, 
then it's basically doing linear regression k times or, or PCA and linear regression k times. So whatever your favorite method is for doing all that PCA, that's the following time. Finding the optimal x by itself is a hard problem, but finding approximate versions of it is is that there exists good algorithms to find approximations of it. Yeah. And again, you know, I think um, there's one perspective is you know putting like a as a theorist, which is the runtime and and in terms of actually finding this optimal matrices, which is large size matrices. But actually, if you do this in in practice, you find these matrices very easily because your data is extremely block structured. It tends out, it just turns out to be in many applications. So uh, it's just as an empirical answer that's 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 separate. As a theoretical answer, yes. Any question? Yeah, so I suppose we're gonna query this for many different roles, right? So is there like some sort of amortization of the computational cost that I could do so that I can run this algorithm efficiently across many roles? Yeah, so if you know if, if it's the same, like you know, if you're trying to find this guy here and this guy is filled out, then I can use the same X. And we'll talk about this in experiment design in a second. I'll, I'll come back and answer that more at a given point in a second. Okay, so this is exactly go back to your question of how would you amortize it optimally if you could choose which entries to see? So here's the perspective of experiment design uh, from the lens of causal matrix completion. So here's a, this connects back to what was talked about in the slide in the talk before. You, you know, a lot of times when you go to do drug design, you start in vitro studies and you go towards clinical trials. The in vitro studies are extremely inefficient. They're slow, rigid, take a long time, they cost a lot of money, and there's a high failure rate. And so the question is can we identify the most promising therapies with a very limited experimental budget? So here's one way of thinking about it. Say you had M cell types and N different therapies. I want to recover the outcomes of all M times N experiments, but say I only give you a budget of M plus N experiments to run. Okay. Which, which ones should you query? So here's, here's a matrix perspective of it. I have M cell types, I have N therapies. Which of these entries should I, should I query, as you said, to amortize best? That's your question. So this is what you should do. You should create an L. Okay. So if you create an L like this, it's actually the most sample efficient thing to do. And you can show that you can recover all the outcomes of all M times N experiments at an entry-wise rate of one over square root K by running at most m times k squared plus n times k cubed experiments. So get these L's when you're running experiments. And some interesting questions uh, for the future is like, if I had to do the adaptive setting, um, how would you design the experiments? And also given its connections to contextual bandits, where I think of rows and columns as state and action, how do I think about inferences, regret bounds, uh, from this perspective, from this perspective of matrix completion, those are interesting things that I've been thinking about recently. One quick question about yeah. that. So, so this this is optimal given the budget. Optimal given the budget, yes. But uh, you can also show that for any matrix, you can't do any better than n plus n times n r. But if I wanted to optimize given the objective or given constraints on the objective, then it's not. I'm thinking of like, for example, key restaurant where the optimization is more, or my constraint is on the objective rather than on the, the samples. I don't think I have an answer on that for, for how well they invertible, invertible there. Mm -hmm. Very sharp problem. Uh, we get better results in the error in terms of to repeat the question, please. So you had this assumption that the minimum singular vector, the singular value of the noise yeah. uh, of your signal has to be dominant. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. So so uh, if I had a lot of budget, what I would do is I try to find um, separate, I'll try to create those K sub matrices as if each of them has this element. Right. Versus, let's say one of them has the elbow, one of them doesn't. Maybe by permuting the the call the rows in some way, then they both have it. Because your error kind of scales with the minimum uh, single value separation of, of any of those matrices. So you would kind of keep trying to find them until you find that elbow with each of those things. Uh, thinking of the 
Yeah. It's sort of like while root n, you have all of the entries observed plus noise. Um, so this one does not saturate that awkward. No, uh, yeah. So there, there's a square root uh, that, that's a uh, that's a head. Um, I'll go on very quickly to the hexagonastic variance estimation. So, in particular, to produce those confidence intervals, um, I need to estimate the second moment of epsilon, which I write as sigma square ij. Okay. Uh, in general, you know, if the variance could be different across the ijs, and so how would you estimate these things, which is crucial to produce the confidence intervals? Well, we're going to use our usual trick: is that let's assume the sigma square ijs are low rank as well. If that's the case, then what can you do? Well, first note that if I take an entry y squaring of each entry y, right? Um, in expectation, it's m square ij plus sigma square ij. And so let's define um, sigma and s as the as the as these two matrices. Then you can prove that the rank of s of this matrix is bounded above by the square of the rank of your original matrix m plus the rank of your, your sigma matrix. Right, so if your M is low rank and your variances are, if, you're, if your first moment is low rank of M and the second moment is epsilon is low rank, then this entry wise squaring is also going to be low rank. Right. And so here's an estimator. So first I do is I, I take my original data Y with the missing values. I apply synthetic nearest neighbors to it to get M hat IJ. Then I do an entry wise squaring of each entry and I apply synthetic nearest neighbors again. And because an expectation it's m square ij plus sigma square ij, that's exactly, it'll produce a good estimate for that. Okay. And then if I want to produce sigma square ij, I take what value I got here and I subtract it from the square of this guy. And now I have an estimate for the variance. Right. And this is a meta algorithm. It doesn't even need to be for syntax nearest neighbor. You could replace this with nuclear norm minimization, whatever you want. Right. It's just like a meta algorithm, two step way to compute heteroscedastic variances, which are the important problem in statistics econometrics. So the power statistical guarantees you can show is that it would scale basically as the maximum error of these two things for the highest level. Just make a silly question. Like, there's a guarantee uh, because you're using the rank structure, you don't even care about how the numbers are represented. Suppose I scale a bunch of rows, a bunch of columns by a different amount. Yeah. It's like it, it's completely, or it doesn't care about like the scaling at all. It's, it's, I, I guess that's maybe my question. Yeah, like would it affect? So suppose I represented some entry using different units. Would the guarantees depend on that? Or? Yeah. So what I'm finding in the variance estimator is the is a beta that that represents the, your target row as the other rows. That the two norm of that shows up as well. Okay. So maybe you should then normalize the, the units in which you're measuring things. Okay, the last, uh, okay, so the, the kind of the philosophical message uh, I want to leave you with this part of the talk is that causal inference is many times called a missing data problem. And matrix completion, for those of us who do that, is called a missing data problem. And there's a lot of beautiful mappings between these two things. So in causal inference, you have a question of a causal estimate that can be thought of as uh, recovering a matrix in a certain norm. Um, in causal inference, you have what we call confounded data. That really amounts to having missing not at random data. Uh, in causal inference, you have different kinds of observational and experimental studies that really amounts to having different kinds of sparsity patterns in matrix completion. And the goal of causal inference is to estimate potential outcomes. And the goal of matrix completion is to impute missing entries. And they kind of have this one to one mapping between these two things, which I really like seeing. Okay, in the next five minutes, I'll give you a very quick tour of the things I'm thinking about nowadays, which is of uh, causal offline RL. And I'll try to connect it with what we just talked about. So what at least I find interesting about RL, when I think about what is behind some of the most popular achievements in RL, it's the ability to ask questions and answer questions of the following form, which is what if some agent took some action at a given state? And the simulator basically gives you as an oracle for these kinds of questions. Okay. So if you think about say, and to me, this is a causal question. So if you think of board games and video games where you have like your Atari and, Alpha and your Go 
you have the simulator for free, right? The rules of the board game basically give you an answer to this kind of question. And the otherwise, what you do is you build these really complicated simulators, physical simulators of your system, say in robotics. And what I believe is a challenge to the widespread use of RL is building such simulators for more complex engineering and, and social systems. And I know the simulators are also abundant in, in, in very core engineering systems, say in robotics, we talked about in network simulators, like uh, where we think about queuing models for, for latency. So a very topical one that people use in NS3. In, in circuits, people use something called SPICE. So people have, have handcrafted these simulators to come up and, and think about the algorithms. And as I said, because these engineering systems are getting increasingly complex and we're starting to integrate them with social systems, we can't always simulate a system at will. Let's need to come up with alternate methods to do that. The question is, can we build causal simulators for RL using historical data? What I mean by that is where you have offline data, where you just get say state action, say reward uh, uh, trajectory per patient. You can't experiment with your system. And it's observational data. So what I mean by that is for those of you who study uh, these kinds of systems in an MDP, let's say a POMDP, in a partially observed Markov decision process, the state transition can be a function of a latent factor that you don't see, but your action is a function of observed observe state, right? And what makes this problem harder, what I called uh, causal RL is where the action itself has a latent factor going into it and I call it a latent confounder. This is what makes it harder than a POMDP. And so here's a, a, um, a, some more on the empirical side of work we've done on it. Uh, and this is with collaborators at, at, at MIT. So I'll just do a very quick uh, run through of it. So here we took one, a very simple uh, system from OpenAI, which is a, a, um, a, the OpenAI gym where people try out different RL algorithms. The first one you go there is something called mountain car, which is a nonlinear control problem. We want to take this car uh, up to the top of a hill. Right, And it's underpowered, so you can't just drive it all the way to the top. You gotta to keep going left and right, left and right to build momentum, and then you get to the top of the car, to the top, okay? So the state in this case, the car's position velocity, the actions are going left, right, or doing nothing. And then you can have different um, um, environments. So I can, the one thing you can tune in the open air gym is the gravity of the system or the mass of the car equivalently. And under different levels of gravity, you have different optimal policies. Right? So if you have very weak gravity and it's not unpowered, you can just go right. If you have moderate gravity, you want to go left and right. For, you want to keep, keep going, uh, you want to go left first to create enough momentum, and then you can just go right. If it's strong gravity, then you have to go left and right repeatedly to create enough momentum like a year ago. And if you run like uh, different DQN policies on OpenAI, it kind of reflects what, what I'm saying uh, in English. And if you had such a simulator, right, for, for getting this thing up, for getting this thing up the hill. You can keep trying in the simulator as much as you want. And then using model predictive control or deep QN, you can get to the top of the hill. Okay. And so what I call online RL, for those of you not familiar, is where you have access to the simulator and you can experiment with your system. In offline RL, you don't have access to the simulator. You just have access to limited historical data and it could be observational data, which makes it even harder. And so the question is, can we build a simulator for mountain car using just one observational trajectory for a car. Okay, that's the question we're gonna talk about. And here's a tensor completion perspective of it. So again, rows are states, columns are actions. Each entry here that's in yellow is an observed state action transition that's seen for that particular car. And what's missing is that state action tuple has not been seen. And the entry here is gonna be the next state. Okay, rather than being the reward, it's gonna be the next state. And if you have N different cars, then you cr it creates this tensor. Right, with different entries being seen in the different slices of the tensor. And because the cars have different masses, any policy you learn to use to, to, to drive the system will observe different things based on the latent confounder, which is the mass of the car. And so you have MNAR data because your state action that's visited and the next state that comes out is a function of the mass. That's right? so the latent confounder. And it turns out that if you think of this problem through a low rank, uh, tensor, which is the kind of a, the a higher dimensional analog of, of low rank matrices, you can have this tensor factor model. We have a factor for action, a factor for car, and a factor for the state. And using a neural network, you can kind of learn these low dimensional latent factors. And what person does is, is comes up with an architecture using this perspective with inspiration of tensor completion 
with MNAR data using a nonlinear factor model. And the latent factors that I actually learned turn out to be very meaningful. So if you look at the mountain car example, it's kind of a 2D, pro 2D projection of the learned latent factor for the car. It really corresponds really well with the true gravity of that car, or the mass of that car. We applied it for other settings, say in, uh, in a half cheetah, which is a more complex system. Again, the two-dimensional latent factor that's learned for the, for the cheetah turns out to be correspond really nicely with the true mass of the cheetah and so on and so forth. So these latent factors really turn out to be quite meaningful. And it's, it's, a, it's a good way of thinking about this problem. And so this is the last slide. So here I'm comparing it with uh, a state-of-the-art method called CADM, which is context-aware uh, dynamic model, which also learns simulators, but does it with offline, with online data. And um, I'm gonna run a simulator for you. So here's what Persim does. In dark gray is what is learned. In, true, in the true is what actually is happening. So you want them to be really close to each other and Persim is doing it really well. And because the data is offline and it's confounded, you can see CADM is, is failing. <clears throat> so to end, um, I guess my, my takeaway message for you all is engineering and OR needs causal inference for modern decision making. And um, in particular, we need to bridge these two fields. And causal and matrix sensor completion is an effective framework to pose these questions and to design algorithms. Okay, these are some references. And with that, I thank you very much. Uh, so there's a lot of questions during the talk, just to keep us on time. Uh, last ask some questions during the break. So we have a break for Yeah, okay.